So how, how do we do this? Okay. First of all, we have to make these resources and these places available to the public. I mean, we have to continue to, to drive the public to this and, to, and to, to, to open the trails, to make sure the fish are there, to make sure people appreciate. We have to do everything we can to get people out in this ever dwindling size of conserved world that we have. And once again, it came natural where I was from. Uh, that's what we did. We got up and went fishing and, and went hunting and did, did the things that you do. Uh, not so much now, as much kids. But we also need to make these connectors that people can make a difference in protecting air, protecting water, protecting resources in, in a lot of ways. And let me just give you one very, very short example of how it, it was seared into me. My, my father ran for mayor in my hometown of DeSoto, Missouri, because we were, at the time, straight piping sewage into the Joachim Creek, killing the fish. He heard there was a Clean Water Act. You could get grants for He won. He got the grant. We built a sewage plant. By the time I was a senior in high school, we could eat the fish again that we caught in Joachim Creek. Fast forward that to my time in the legislature. We were presented with an opportunity to begin the Katy Trail, just as we are presented with an opportunity now to continue moving forward on this great asset of our state. It wasn't that easy to get it through the legislature. And there are a lot of people in this room that had a lot to do with that getting done, and I thank you for that, but more importantly, the hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that use it each year from here and across the world, thank you. But when I stood on the Senate floor in that debate that we won by one vote, and the appropriations to begin that trail. I hearkened back to how my first involvement in politics and trails. I was a young Boy Scout. A section of a railroad came open in Jefferson County near the Platten Creek. My father and a number of his friends decided that they wanted to make this into a hiking trail, so they began negotiating with the railroad who was giving it up to buy it. This was before the Rails and Trails Act was passed. They were just going to buy it for the unbelievable sum at that time of $10,000. So they raised the $10,000, and they made the offer to make it a park in Jefferson County. Unfortunately, the county commission didn't agree with them because groups of citizens would come in and complain that folks would come down from St. Louis, would hike 20 or 30 miles into the middle of Jefferson County to commit who knows what sort of larceny, taking corn or whatever, uh, but that was enough to have the county commission vote that they did not want it. So my dad and his friends didn't really give up. And that really was my first story of politics. They used that $10,000, and those three members of the county commission were defeated in the next election. The actions that we take has consequence, and we have to fight for the positions that we have. If we stand mute, if we stand calm, if we stand silent, sprawl will overcome us. If we don't take our responsibility to educate and protect and use it aggressively or be divided because of our various strong interests that we have, we will be defeated. So. One of the key things that has to come from this is to set aside, divide out areas of disagreement, and get to shared principles of progress. Those shared principles are not something that some politician standing in front of you is going to give a speech and tell you what our shared principles are. You don't, you don't speechify about shared principles. They have to be a value, not a position. And a value is something that you don't get by, by just reading it and, and reciting it. You can't memorize a value. You have to embody values. And people need to make sure that they buy into our mission of conservation protection and that they understand that the failure to do so will have dire and dangerous consequences for our way of life in the future. The examples are clear in that area. 
One of those that has been a challenge in this state that I think we've made serious and real progress on by working together. We're not done yet, but we have made serious progress is in the area of confined animal feeding operations. When they first came to our state, we were giving, in essence, out economic development grants that were coming and we were making these huge farms, but they had no plan for dealing with the massive quantities of waste that would come, especially from the hog facilities. If you remember back 10, 11, 12, 14 years ago, story after story after story in our papers about manure tsunamis that would rush into the waters of our state. Now, as Attorney General, I was involved in that because if you put manure in the water, that is a problem. So we were involved in significant litigation. But when we got to the near the end of that litigation, rather than just trying to ring up a number and get a headline, instead we engaged with many of the people in this room right here to try to seek a resolution to this that would make a difference. So in that action against PSF, for example, we got $25 million that was used not just to pay a one-time fine, but instead was invested in next generation technology. And we went out and put together a three-person team of the leading experts in the country and have spent the last 10 years in this state under the able leadership of many, many people buying in and looking at what technology is available to get down the odor, to limit that effluent to zero. The shared principle we had that has led us to a time in which we are cleaner, which we are better, which the smell is worse, less worse than it was, in which effluents don't go into the streams. When's the last time you've seen of a significant fish fill because of this? The shared principle we had was a very, very simple one. And it was a principle of agriculture called the good neighbor policy. When you own a farm and operate a farm, part of the legacy in this state is that you have three responsibilities. One, to raise crops or animals and feed your family. Two is to pass that on in a better way than you got it to your children or grandchildren so that they too will have the option to farm that piece of property. And number three is to be a great neighbor to your friends and neighbors in need, whether it's helping them when they were bringing in some hay or putting out a fire or having them over for dinner. We use the good neighbor policy in dealing with the environmental laws on CAFOs. And did we get it perfect? No. But have we reduced pollution dramatically? You bet we have. Have we moved to a time in which waste treatment and energy facilities are now being produced in the state of Missouri that can be used in the future, you bet we have. So these moments come all the time. As we sit here right now and look to the future, we have serious water challenges in the state. We have been blessed generally by having plenty of quantity of water. Although if you look in the southwest sectors of this state with the dropping water pool in southwest Missouri and you put that on some sort of chart and you take the last 10 or 15 years of the dropping of that water level, that, my friends, if you, if you carry that out onto any sort of lengthy, <laughs> lengthy indices, you'll have thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of problems of sinking wells and cleaning water and not scrubbing that water clean as it comes through that aquifer. That is, for the first time in the history of the state of Missouri, we may have real and significant issues about water quantity, not just water quality. And make no mistake, we don't want to end our water quantity battles the way they have many times out west. 